everyone. Welcome to the Book Lounge. Today we are talking about Letters to Lasilius by Seneca. Your hosts, as always, are myself, Corinne Ritchie. And me, Tom Butler Bowden. And the general aim with Book Insights and Book Lounge, as you know by now, is to uh, cover each week a great nonfiction book um, that can help you in your work or your life or just make you think. Um, and I will give my take on, uh, on the book, why I think it's still relevant and uh, some of the highlights. And I'll weigh in on the book and update you with the latest news about the author and the title. Now, just remember that the Book Insights episodes are where you go for the in-depth explorations of these best nonfiction books. But here in the Book Lounge, it's more just an informal chat about the book of the week. And new this season, we're bringing in guests to join our Book Lounge chat. Uh, this week, our guest has been featured by Forbes, the Wall Street Journal, the BBC, and many others for his expertise on stoicism. Um, he is an author, speaker, and psychotherapist who runs an international event called Stoic Week and teaches Stoic mindfulness and resilience training. Let's welcome Donald Robertson. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation today. Yes, yeah, awesome. so... Um... I, I admit, I've, uh, Don and I have known each other for a while. Um, I think we met through, because uh, I was involved in the self-help literature. And um, at the time, Donald, I think you were doing training in, um, uh, in your CBT, uh, giving courses and so on. Um, but I was just wondered how you, um, uh, how you sort of came to your background and expertise in Stoicism. And, you know, perhaps your first discovery of Seneca. Well, I guess philosophy was the first thing that I got into, really. And I started pretty young. And uh, I, I began reading um, Plato, I think was one of the first philosophers that I got into. I started off reading a lot of religious texts and stuff. And that got me into reading uh, Plato when I was like 16 or 17 or something like that. And then I... Partly as a consequence of that, I went to Aberdeen and studied philosophy for four years. And then I went to Sheffield and did a master's degree in integrative philosophy and psychotherapy. So I, it was my master's degree, really, that got me into the niche that I've since occupied, which is the relationship between philosophy and psychotherapy. And I, I started off, actually, trying to look at the relationship between existential philosophy and psychoanalytic psychotherapy. And then I very quickly realized that that wasn't really working out for me. And I jumped ship to look at the relationship between stoicism and cognitive behavioral therapy. And that was, I don't know, like 25 years ago or something like that. Now it's quite a long time ago. And ever since then, that's been what I've been studying and, and writing about and stuff. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what would you say for those who are familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy, or maybe they see a personal therapist themselves, what's something that would be useful for them to know about that important relationship that you study between stoicism and uh, CBT? Well, the earliest form of cognitive therapy or the precursor of cognitive therapy, depending on how you look at it, is a thing called rational emotive behavior therapy that was developed in the 1950s by a famous psychotherapist called Albert Ellis. And Ellis had read the Stoics, um, not so much Seneca, actually. He'd read Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, the other two famous Stoics. And he, cognitive therapy, including Ellis's approach, is based on something we now call the cognitive model of emotion. And that's the idea that our emotions are shaped to a large extent, if not exclusively, by underlying beliefs. And that was what the Stoics believed as well. So Ellis realized that he was reintroducing an old idea. And also, you know, a big part of being a psychotherapist, a cognitive psychotherapist or any evidence-based psychotherapist, is that you study all of these research studies, which you have to go to university to learn how to interpret, you learn research methods. And then you've got to somehow translate that into layman's terms to communicate it to clients. So every psychotherapist, in a sense, should be a kind of translator of scientific jargon and research yeah. into simple terms. And to do that, Ellis would use a quote from the Stoics. So he would quote Epictetus saying, it's not things that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. And he mm. thought that was the neatest way to explain the cognitive model of emotion mm. to his clients and his students. And so he told them all this quote from Epictetus and it became almost a cliche in psychotherapy. So 
Cognitive therapy and stoicism share this absolutely fundamental premise in common. It's a point of overlap between them, uh, the cognitive theory of emotion. Oh, that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I meant to say that um, Donald is a great expert on Marcus Aurelius uh, oh. in the meditations, really. Mm -hmm. I, he's written a best-selling book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, which mm -hmm. we'll put in the show notes. Um, and I guess Marcus Aurelius, The Meditations, is probably more famous, um, has mm -hmm. been read by more people. Um, so just a, a bit of an introduction to Seneca, in case you are not familiar um, with him. Um, he, uh, he was a guy who was very much at the centre of Roman power. Um, he was sort of a de facto ruler. We can go into it more detail of Rome for several years. Um, and he was incredibly wealthy as well as a result of being at the centre of power. But he also fancied himself as a great scholar and writer. And that sort of, that was his ticket to, to fame in, in ancient Rome. Um, this is what attracted the attention of people that brought him closer to the Emperor Nero. So um, he wrote many things, tragedies, letters, uh, in the same way today that, you know, you do a post online and it goes viral. Um, Seneca would, would write these letters on various subjects or people and get them published and they would sort of go off like wildfire. So he was sort of, he was one of the most famous writers of his day. And one of the things he produced was these letters to Lucilius. Um, Lucilius, we don't know much about him, but he was um, probably a real person. Um, and so Seneca used this as a means of um, conveying his Stoic philosophy through these letters. Um, there are 124 written um, around sort of 60, 70 AD, um, and they... Uh, are sort of about very much everyday life things. So they'll begin with a um, uh, mentioning something that's happened to Lucilius um, or to Seneca, and he'll use this as a pretext to go off on some aspect of Stoic um, philosophy. Um, and uh, some of the themes that he talks about, uh, if you're not familiar with Stoic philosophy, is like contemplating death, um, and how that can change you and your, your attitudes. Um, having role models, um, which can uh, bring you uh, greater virtue. Um, so Donald is just wondering what, um, how you see these, these letters that, he, that Seneca wrote um, as, as part of his philosophy and his work. Well, I've got a theory. <laughs> right. So I'm going to spec. I'm going to speculate about this, right? I think Se Seneca implies that he was a failed legal advocate or lawyer. Um, so that was kind of what he was doing initially, and then he seems to imply that for some reason he stopped doing that, and he was sent into exile initially uh, under the Emperor Claudius. And round about that time, he started writing a particular genre of letter, which is very well known associated with Stoic philosophy, but other schools of philosophy as well, called the Consolation Letter. And he wrote these letters to famous, uh, influential Rome, members of the Roman elite, uh, people close to the emperor's court. And those seem to, like you said, have gone viral because shortly after that, he seems to be quite famous as a writer. So he wrote these Consolation Letters and they, they made him uh, a big deal. And, and I think from that point onwards, he really in a sense, it's hard to make a comparison with what we would mean by a writer today, but he was kind of a famous writer, really, and that became his, his thing, um, and then was later hired as a, a rhetoric teacher for the Emperor Nero, but again, he wasn't uh, actually a, a professor of rhetoric, per se, he kind of uh, stumbled into that, that gig as well. So I think he started writing these typical consolation letters, which drew heavily in Stoic philosophy. And then at the end of his career, we have these letters from Lasilius. I think they're a sort of development out of that. Like, he, you know, he kind of, uh, he, struck, uh, he struck lucky 
um, with these initial letters. They were very popular and he carried on doing it, of course. It worked out well for him. And then he refines it more and more until by the end we get these more sophisticated letters. Not ex Although they're not all consolation letters, although the letters to Lasilius actually contain, I think, maybe uh, three or four letters that would arguably fall in that genre. But all of them draw on similar philosophical themes that are kind of similar in a way. Um, and uh, I, I think that's really the de how he developed uh, over the course of his career and, and ended up doing that. You know, I think he progressively got more into Stoicism as his career progressed. Mm. And do you think he, I mean, what, there are many aspects to Stoic philosophy. For you, Donald, what is the, the sort of aspect or theme of Stoicism that Seneca um, emphasises the most or, or has become best known for compared, say, to Marcus Aurelius? He, Seneca says more about uh, what we call premeditation of adversity or premeditatio malorum. So he, he talks about that quite explicitly several times. So this is the Stoic idea that we should imagine typical things that go wrong in life, like poverty, exile, sickness, and so on, and just prepare ourselves in advance for them. So we should imagine before it actually happens, well in advance, um, like a psychological fire drill, like what would happen if I got really sick or what would happen if I was dying or what would happen if I, my marriage broke down or I lost my job and then mentally rehearse how you would, what it would be like to cope wisely and with courage and self-discipline with those things so you're readier for them. You know, and of course we're living in the perfect time for that because the pandemic would be a, a really good example People often say to me, what would the Stoics say we should do to cope with the pandemic? And I say, well, you know, actually, uh, the main thing the Stoics would say is that we should have already prepared for it long in advance. <laughs> um, they would have they would have said, like Bill Gates said ages ago, you know, there's, there's probably going to be a pandemic eventually. The Stoics would have been all over that. And they would have said, yeah, we should prepare for it. And then during the current one, the Stoics would say we should be preparing for the next one. Like, <laughs> that maybe is going to happen years, decades further down the line because they thought we should uh, use times of peace to prepare for war, as the saying goes, and build our resilience well in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's a big theme in Seneca. There's hints of that in Marcus Aurelius, but it's not quite as explicit. There's that famous passage at the beginning of book two where Marcus, probably the most famous passage in the meditations maybe, where Marcus says every morning when you get up, tell yourself you're going to meet meddlesome and treacherous people and so on. But he doesn't really develop the idea more clearly than that, whereas Seneca spells it out very explicitly. And he also spells out another famous Stoic technique, which we call the reserve clause. So Seneca says very clearly um, that when a Stoic is undertaking an action, and this is a kind of similar technique. It's got more to do with our goals and actions, though, that they should uh, prepare in advance for the possibility they'll fail. So if a Stoic was taking a trip, Seneca says, he would say to himself, I'm going to travel to Athens if nothing prevents me. So he always attaches this caveat in advance. I'll travel to Athens, God willing or fate permitting, like as if he's preparing in advance for the fact that it could go either way. Mm. It's, it's, um, <laughs> it couldn't be more opposite than today's sort of success or motivational literature, which is always to expect the best. Uh -huh. Um and, you know, have a great view of yourself and what you can achieve and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, a lot of, I don't need that negativity in my life type, you know, don't even think about it. Don't even entertain the possibility that you could fail, you know, a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. People said that to Epictetus. We, we have this interesting thing where the famous Stoic teacher Epictetus, we have a, a, a kind of transcription of his lectures or the conversations that he had with his students. And so sometimes the students will say kind of cheeky things to him, they'll, they'll kind of push back a bit. And uh, at one point that he seems to suggest that they're saying, these are words of ill omen. Like, so we shouldn't imagine bad things to happen because it might be bad, it might be unlucky, like the law of attraction or something like that, you can make it happen. Yeah. And Epictetus kind of pours scorn on that. He says, it's only a word of ill omen if you make it into one. You know, you, these are just natural like events in life that could befall anyone. It's not inherently like evil to imagine them 
right? And in fact, if you imagine poverty, but picture yourself coping really courageously and with self-discipline, like that's something positive uh, to be proud of. So he's kind of pushing back against this idea that these are negative things. He goes, actually, what I'm imagining, I think of is the most positive thing in life, which is to see myself as someone who's capable of flourishing in the face of adversity. I think you guys are mistaken even to view these things as inherently negative. For me, mm. they're opportunities for personal growth is basically what he's saying. Right. So, so in Stoicism, the greatest achievement is nothing worldly. It's managing adversity well and yeah. growing. Um, and and uh, I guess developing psychological protections around yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, uh -huh. well, I know you touched on it a little bit, but uh, uh, one of the themes in this book is sort of um, the idea that there isn't, like you said, there's, it's, it's not necessarily good or bad. It's, um, there's just different things that happen. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that might be useful for our listeners, like how to, how that could be helpful in life and work? Yeah, I mean, the Stoics are saying something pretty radical, and they knew that. So they said, look, you should be shocked by Stoic philosophy if you really think about what we're saying. One of the less well-known Stoic authors uses the Greek word epistrophe to describe Stoic philosophy, which is the word that we use for religious conversion. But actually, it means a turning around like a U-turn. Because the Stoics want to say, you know, the prevailing values of the society in which you live, all the consumerism and hedonism and materialism and egotism and narcissism, and all the good isms, right, that make up the moral <laughs> values of the world around us, all those favorite things. <laughs> right? the, the Stoics want to say they're all wrong and it's all completely back to front and true happiness comes from within, not from fame or wealth or all of these external things, which are all partly in the hands of fate. And they say that that's turning the prevailing values of our society upside down, almost. And they sometimes kind of symbolized it in that way. The cynic philosophers, who were the kind of precursors of the Stoics, who came before them, and Stoics and cynics are often thought of as kind of cousins in, in the field of philosophy, closely related schools. The cynics would practice walking backwards along the street and into the flow of a crowd walking out the theater. Someone said to Diogenes the Cynic, what are you doing? Like, why are you walking the wrong way? And Diogenes said, don't you understand that this is what I've been doing my whole life long? Metaphorically, I've been swimming against the, the stream and going in the opposite direction from everybody else, doing this U-turn morally and uh, arriving at a completely different perspective on life. Mm. So this, this idea actually... I'll, 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 do, I'll, go, I'll explain a very little philosophical argument because I think it's a very important one. The central premise of Stoic philosophy is most clearly explained in one of Plato's dialogues called the Euthydemus. And in that dialogue, Socrates is talking to an interlocutor, like a person he's in conversation with, and he says, how would you define good fortune? And like most questions that Socrates asks, it seems like a rhetorical question because it seems like there's an obvious answer. And the interlocutor, uh, his friend, says, well, good fortune is like wealth and good looks and having a, a good position in society and a big house, you know, and a, a, you know, a big TV and, you know, a swimming pool and all these cool things. Like, you know, everybody knows what good fortune consists in Socrates. And Socrates says, well, let's examine each of those in turn and begin, for example, with wealth. And he says, surely wealth is a good thing in the hands of somebody who's wise and virtuous. They could do loads of amazing things with money. But what happens if you give lots of money to somebody who's a genocidal maniac or they're foolish and vicious? Wouldn't it just allow them to do more foolish and vicious stuff more quickly? Um, it just extends the control that you have over your environment. And whether that's good or bad is going to depend on your character uh, and whether you're wise or foolish. And uh, to save you some time, you know, Socrates then says, and this then applies to everything else that you just listed. Like the whole bullet point list that you just gave of things that constitute good fortune are all the same. Like they're all external goods are neither intrinsically good nor bad, but what matters is the use they make of, that you make of them. And then about 40 pages later, so we're skipping a bit, like <laughs> Socrates sums up by saying, therefore, wisdom is the only truly good thing, like knowing how to use things well. And 
folly or vice is the only truly bad thing. And all the things that you guys assume are intrinsically good are, are really um, just external opportunities. They're neither good nor bad. And that basically is the, the premise of Stoic philosophy in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And but Donald, this is where it gets interesting because Seneca, um, he had all those things, that whole bullet list you mentioned. Yes. He, he had all these estates, vineyards, lands. He had, what was it, 300 million sesterces or he's oh. basically like a, like a billionaire or... I think Warren yeah. Buffett. Yeah, 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 Warren yeah, Buffett. Or estate. Um, and, uh, you know, he, was, he had, for a period, he was incredibly powerful as well. Um, so presumably for someone like him, he would struggle even more than your average person with all these attractions and advantages of, of wealth, power, etc. This has always been, and actually there, there are many problems with, with Seneca's wealth. So the idea that Seneca had a lot of money in itself is, as many Stoics today would point out, neither here nor there. Um, wealth is indifferent to Stoics. It's neither good nor bad. What matters is the use they make of it. But it's a bit more complicated than Seneca's case because arguably a lot of that money was given to him by the Emperor Nero. And now we're not talking about the fact that he happens to have a lot of money in the bank. We're talking about the fact that he's now implicated himself in a dictatorial regime by Nero was arguably yeah. Yeah, taking bribes my, which now gives this guy leverage over him. And that's a much more serious problem. It's now a, a very serious moral problem that Seneca's got himself entangled in. And even worse than that, Tom, like Seneca got his friends and members of family positions in Nero's regime. So not only did Nero now have all that wealth to use as leverage over Seneca, he now had his friends and family members um, who he could use as leverage over Seneca. Um, so Epictetus, by contrast, would uh, have said the opposite, like, just don't get involved with these sort of guys, you know, it's going to end up badly. Don't flatter tyrants, like, don't allow them to have any uh, power over you, which is exactly what, what Seneca did. Um, Seneca says, Seneca tries to say that, what is it, once a month for a few days, he, he pretends he's a peasant. <laughs> and he, he's, he'll like fast or he'll, he, he'll eat very simple food, which is a stoic exercise to practice living simply and, and in order to uh, be able to cultivate gratif gratitude and non-attachment. But in Seneca's case, it's kind of pushing it a bit because he wasn't just rich. He was, you know, super rich, like one of the richest men in European history, kind of rich. Interesting. I know we've talked a bit about Trump on this show for different reasons, like we covered Hillbilly Elegy about that kind of connection. And, um, and then we talked with a political psychologist as well. And as we're talking about this, it definitely reminds me of that because he's got this um, appeal to rural America, at least. Uh, of this like every man's man, you know, the pop the like, the, the less affluent folks tend to be the ones that are drifting and and uh, you know are really drawn to Trump, but he is that sort of Seneca type where he's got all of this wealth and this power and you know he's uh, ingratiated himself with some politicians that people you know don't necessarily think are the best and all that kind of thing, um, and so I, I I can see that sort of relationship and you know and it is a, a, a strange kind of juxtaposition between somebody having loads of wealth but then also trying to appeal to the everyday man kind of thing oh gosh you've got you've actually hit on a really good example but i would i would change it slightly mm. and say rather than comparing seneca to trump i would say he's more like those guys the and women who were part of trump's administration and mm. then tried to kind of claim that they were trying to moderate things or improve ah. them from within sure um so i didn't really agree with what trump was doing but i thought it was best to kind of stick in there and try like mm. so that's how people have traditionally defended seneca they said ah. he was a kind of moderating influence on on nero mm. um whereas other people would say yeah but you were also in doing that propping up his regime ah. so there were other stoics at the time several other very prominent uh, stoic philosophers who did the opposite of seneca 
and refused to support Nero and mm -hmm. protested against him in public. Um, so I guess, do you try and change the regime from within or do you stand explicitly in opposition to it? I think history looks more favorably on the people who openly opposed uh, the regime and less favorably on the ones who tried, particularly if they failed, um, to, to moderate things from within. As Thrasea said, the leader of the Stoic opposition, people like Seneca ended up being executed by Nero anyway. Like, so they, uh, he didn't really manage to save his own skin like, or achieve that much in the long run, um, despite the fact he was kind of compromising and uh, attempting to, to support Nero uh, while moderating him. The, a good yeah. example of that is on clemency. This, which is a, another one of uh, Seneca's letters, which praises Nero, but then also encourages him to uh, show more mercy as a ruler. Um, it's a, and it's a really strange mixture of these two things. You can read it either way. On the one hand, on clemency is, is very subtly trying to encourage Nero in the right direction. But on the other hand, you know, it says crazy things. Like he, you know, it portrays him as being a, virtually a philosopher king, and it says his hands are unstained by blood when, in fact, he'd, he'd recently had his little brother murdered. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Out on the boat, wasn't it? That was his mum. Yeah, oh, he, was about, he hadn't got round to that. He was about to murder his mum, oh. and had, had, had just finished murdering his uh, his half brother. Yeah. I mean, there were different times. In some ways, they, had, I guess, different moral standards, and you you could say that things are very different. But the thing that interests me about Seneca's writings, I think you you've talked about this before in the past, Donald, is that they they've they almost present sort of the ideal version of himself. Yeah. Um, so how do we separate, you know, Seneca's writings? which, you know, uh, can be as, as inspiring as any Stoic writer like Marcus Aurelius and, yeah. and the actual person behind them. It, it, this is a perennial problem with literature in general, isn't it? Like the relationship between the artist and the work of art that they create. And I think we have to remember that Seneca is a rhetorician. And if we look closely, we can see him actually using various rhetorical strategies to shape his public image. Um, but he... Uh, and we also we uh, Seneca Seneca's writings are, are are timeless and beautiful and profound, and that's th this is why they've survived for such a long time because people gain so much benefit from them. But there is this real contrast between that and what we know about the his his life as a historical figure. You mentioned earlier that he uses again a kind of rhetorical strategy of describing um, everyday events. So he talks about being on a boat that's caught in a storm and he panics and jumps over the side and swims to shore. And he describes it in very vivid terms. He talks about staying in an inn, I think, and it's really noisy outside and it's disturbing his concentration, stuff like that. So it seems very mundane and, and, and very natural, um, but that's carefully crafted. Uh, he doesn't say, oh yeah, by the way, I was writing a speech for Nero the other day. Or he doesn't say, oh, yeah, I was talking to the Praetorian prefect the other day. So there's a notable absence of any biographical vignettes that relate to, you know, major parts of his life as a, an advisor to the, the emperor. He, he portrays his life in very vivid terms, but also in weirdly homely terms that, that, that doesn't really, he doesn't say, oh, yeah, I was throwing a massive banquet with like hundreds of guests the other day that, costs, you know, hundreds of sesterces to put. He doesn't say things like that, although we know that that's what his life was actually like. So he paints a very, very vivid picture of his life, but it, it's a very selective picture, uh, not at all representative of what the, the histories make out his life to be like. Um, so I think we have to separate the man um, from his writings. And I mean, also the other thing that we don't really know, and I know this upsets people sometimes who are fans of a particular ancient author, um, but, but in Seneca's case, for example, we, we really don't know how much of his ideas are, are original, um, you know, because if maybe about 1% of the original Stoic writings survive, um, it may be that Seneca's paraphrasing a lot of area, earlier writings. You know, I think it's a, a kind of fallacy in a way to assume that 
the concepts that he writes about are his own invention, because most of them actually are. They're, they're, they're derivative of earlier sources, and he's probably, to a very large extent, you know, really just paraphrasing stuff that he's read in other books. Um, mm. That doesn't take away from his genius. He's an incredibly, he's still an incredible writer. Actually, I would like, I'll say something about his writing style as well. Mm. That maybe sounds like I'm bashing Seneca, but I also, I'm, got, I'm kind of, it's, I think of it more as an even-handed portrayal. I love Seneca's writing style. And actually, people in general love it today because it's very, it fits in with contemporary tastes today. Short sentences and punchy yeah. and... Like Twitter, right? He writes in tweets. He, write, he writes after amazing aphorisms um, have survived throughout the ages and become maxims and slogans. So he he'd be you know killing it on Twitter today if he was uh, if he was around. He'd definitely get a job in the White House doing the tweets, like for sure. But at the time, um, Roman professors of of rhetoric and oratory uh, sneered at his writing style. And there are obvious flaws in it, like compared to Cicero, the other master of uh, Latin rhetoric, Cicero forms these long arguments um, that are very carefully crafted. Seneca seems incapable of doing that. Like he contradicts himself from one page to another. His arguments are unconvincing or fragmentary or incomplete, but there's little memorable bits to it. So he's, he, he's not good at sustained thinking. But he's good at coming out with brilliant flashes of uh, rhetoric and insight. And today, people find Cicero's essays perhaps harder to read because um, it requires more sustained concentration on the part of the reader. Um, and they prefer Seneca's more kind of bite-sized style. But there is this flaw in it that he's not as good at formulating a coherent uh, argument uh, over the course of a an essay or letter as, as other authors in, in the Roman world were expected to be. Mm. Um, one of the things I, I love about the Seneca's letters is you really do get a sense of what life was like in Rome at the time. I mean, he talks a lot about Saturnalia festivals and traveling on boats from one place to another and houses that he's seen on the, on the coast and, and, little affairs, you know, in, in his household. Um, and, and one of the aspects, he's got a whole chapter or a whole letter on dealing with slaves. And one, mm. of the, one of the sort of odious things, I guess, for a modern person is understanding these great Stoics or writers that were rich and that had a lot of slaves. Um, and you think, okay, sure, you know, they had this great life. They could write about these philosophical thoughts because they were at the top of this pyramid of human life. Um, but what, what, did, what was Seneca's view of, of slavery and the slaves in his household? Let's see, well, okay, this is another area where there's a conflict perhaps, um, at least there appears to be between what he writes and what he did. We don't know how many slaves Seneca had. So I'm, I've, I'm gonna hazard a guess like that's pure speculation based on what we know about other Roman households, that Seneca may have owned something like 500 slaves at a rough, uh, at a rough stab in the dark. Um, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be surprising or unusual, maybe even more, because uh, he owned several villas, uh, large villas, and put on huge parties with hundreds and hundreds of guests. So it's quite plausible that altogether he owned something like 500, maybe even 1,000 uh, slaves. And... Uh, Yet, in his essays, he doesn't question the institution of slavery, but he does question the idea that slaves are inferior. So he seems kinder towards slaves than other Romans would be. And he seems to be criticizing Romans um, for mistreating slaves and looking down on them. Um, so sometimes people are pointed to that to say, Seneca seems to be kind of questioning the idea of slavery, but he doesn't, and, it's, and it's, in some ways it's almost surprising that he doesn't just go a little bit further and cast doubt in the whole institution. And in fact, other Stoics did. Um, so it may be that he was just kind of holding back a little bit, but certainly even in Marcus Aurelius, there, there are, there's a passage where he seems to, to indirectly question the, the whole concept of uh, enslaving enemies captured in warfare. 
Um, he refers to it as somebody who takes pride in doing that. He says is the mentality of a brigand or a robber. In other words, it's injustice. It's a kind of theft to enslave somebody. You're stealing them from nature and depriving them of their natural freedom. It's morally wrong. And this is an argument that we find in other ancient authors associated with the Stoic school. And even the early Stoics, we're told there are fragments that suggest that they questioned the institution of, of slavery. Um, but Seneca was so enmeshed in that world, um, it would have been you know, uh, difficult for him not to have had hundreds of slaves, given the, the scale of his wealth. Um, so he's like a good Stoic questioning the way that slaves are treated, but he doesn't quite go uh, as, as far as some other philosophers might have gone. Got it. Interesting. Um, yes, so, um, I mean, for me, what I get out of Seneca is this, the, the beautiful writing. Um, I think we're getting to this point in the interview where we start deliberating, <laughs> a rating for the book. Um, for me, the, the the beautiful writing is is uh, is right right up there. Um, he's got. I mean, he talks about so many different subjects um, relating to to human nature and life and time, friendship, death. Um, you name it, everything mm -hmm. that um, today's self help writer uh, mm -hmm. people give TED talks on. You know, Seneca's been yeah. there and done that. And he's put together some very nice uh, thoughts on all of them. Um, so, Donald, is there any any sort of areas of his thought that you particularly like, or that or that stands out to you in terms of like topics? Well, first of all, I just want to say that having said that, I think Seneca would be killing it on Twitter. I think Cicero would give a better TED talk, like, but uh, but Seneca Seneca would would also give quite a good TED talk. I like exactly like you said, I think his writing style is remarkable. It's highly memorable. He covers a vast range of subjects, you know, and despite my qualms about his personality and his, his life, I, I cherish his writings and I, I've read them over and over and over again um, throughout the years. And I, 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 quote, I find myself quoting, sometimes I find myself quoting Seneca more than I quote Marcus Aurelius, although I'm more, uh, I've spent more time studying Marcus Aurelius. So I, incred I think his writings are incredibly valuable. And the, the other odd thing about Seneca is that when I was a young guy, first reading Seneca, um, I remember thinking there were passages that I could have ripped the page out and pasted it into a modern psychotherapy book and nobody would have known the difference. In particular, uh, and you may have noticed this, Tom, there's a passage where he talks about the fight or flight response in some kind of grazing animal like a deer, and he talks about how when animals are frightened, like they become anxious and run away. But as soon as the predator's gone, they'll gradually calm down and return to grazing. Whereas humans continue to worry about it for days or weeks afterwards. And he says, because our greatest gift, our ability to think about the future or to ruminate, ruminate about the past, it is also our, our, our greatest uh, weakness. And that passage in particular, I thought, could have been written in a modern book on stress. Um, you know, basically verbatim, and I wouldn't even have noticed that uh, it came from a, an ancient Roman author. Mm. Um, Corinne wrote down some of your favourite quotes, didn't you, Corinne, from Seneca? But just yeah. I'll read out the third one because it relates just to what Donald was saying. Mm -hmm. Seneca said, we suffer more often in imagination than in reality. <laughs> there you go. Um, Corinne, what were those, those other couple that you um, liked. Yeah, yeah. So there were definitely some standout passages for me in this in this text. Um, I really liked one quote that said, there's no enjoying the possession of anything valuable unless one has someone to share it with. Um, I feel like out of everything we've talked about with Seneca, that's probably an area that he would know a lot about is, uh, you know, he had all these possessions, but if even he is saying that the true value is in the people, the relationships, the enjoyment, um, I think that's something we can really um, benefit from and, and some wisdom there. Um, I also liked one that says, uh, nothing, Lucilius, is ours except time. We were entrusted by nature with the ownership of this single thing so fleeting and slippery that anyone who will can oust for us from possession. 
um, just a, a really interesting way of thinking about time and and what a gift it is and uh, just really trying to to cherish that that as much as we can mm -hmm. yeah it's you you see any interview with like a, a billionaire today and they say oh, i've got same amount of time that you have mm -hmm. uh it's the most precious thing um so yeah timeless and um in terms of like Seneca's influence, um, you know, what uh, his, apparently Shakespeare had, was, was, you know, mm -hmm. found influence him. And who else do you know, um, Donald, that's sort of particularly been influenced by Seneca? Well, we, we, we just touched on this very briefly, but Seneca also wrote a whole bunch of tragedies. Um, we don't even know whether they were performed or not, but some people have questioned um, the quality. I think they're astounding. I think they're remarkable. And they show his talent as a writer. And it was his tragedies that influenced Shakespeare. And they do have little bits of stoicism uh, scattered into them, contrary to what sometimes people say. Um, I would also say in a parallel universe, modern psychotherapy would be more influenced by Seneca because there was an early 20th century psychotherapist called Paul Dubois, who was really into Seneca and prescribed reading letters to Lucilius to his patients. And he was a rival of Freud and Freud became more famous and eventually people kind of forgot about Dubois. And it was another few decades before Albert Ellis reintroduced Stoicism to psychotherapy drawing more on Epictetus and uh, not so much on Seneca. But it could have, there was a false start there. Otherwise, Seneca could have been, you know, this huge dominant influence on, on modern psychotherapy. It almost happened. Um, so there's another area where uh, if there's still, if Dubois and, Dubois and his followers were really into Seneca, modern psychotherapists, I think, could be as well. You know, they should, it's about time that they rediscovered him. Mm. Absolutely. And Corinne, is there any other sort of, contemporary people or influences that have that mentioned Seneca or influenced by them? Yeah, yeah. Looking uh, through, I found that um, Thomas Jefferson had Seneca on his nightstand when he died. That's a kind of an right. interesting one. So he, uh, he, and it makes me think, oh man, what's on my nightstand when I'm dead? What are they going to find? No, I'm not <laughs> sure. Might want to double check that. Maybe get a good one, put it over there. Uh, Tim Ferriss, so a recent podcaster mm. guy says he regularly gifts this particular book so letters to Lucilius he gives out to friends and relatives because it changed his life and he reads it uh, regularly um, mm -hmm. he actually turned them into an audiobook series that anyone can listen to for free so you can listen to the full you know letters to Lucilius uh, by Tim Ferriss I guess reading it or something um, mm -hmm. let's see Oh, also recently with the pandemic, as Donald, as you mentioned, um, there's just been a lot of Stoic and, and Seneca work kind of floating around in different articles as people are trying to cope and they can see the value of the Stoic philosophy during this time of confusion and panic and, um, and, and lockdown of just having so much time on your hands and not knowing you know, how to cope. Um, so yeah, definitely I've been seeing a lot of Seneca and other Stoic uh, articles popping up as, you know, different resources are, uh, uh, that are trying to be given out to people who are, you know, dealing with the pandemic. Cool. Well, as you mentioned, Thomas Jefferson, I'd say as well, George Washington mm -hmm. um, was really into Seneca and had read letters to Lasilius, as well as uh, some of Seneca's other dialogues. Uh, it seems to have been one of, uh, one of the books that influenced him. Um, mm. I have to say probably the most interesting Seneca reference that I saw pop up um, as I'm, you know, researching like, okay, who's talking recently about Seneca was uh, during the pandemic, of course, everyone's talking about the toilet paper because there isn't any or there wasn't any, at least in the spring of last year. Um, and so apparently in this letters to Lucilius, there is a reference to xylospongium. And so as people are freaking out about toilet paper and thinking, how do I cope? They're saying, hey, listen to Seneca, here's how to cope. And also, as you're thinking about toilet paper, here's a reference in Seneca's book about what they used, which was sea sponge on a stick stored in like vinegar and rinsed in water and you just pass it on to the next person. So not only do you know how to cope, you also get a fun idea in case you just can't find toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> wow, how did I miss that when I was reading the letters? <laughs> um, 
All right, guys, this is a time where we give a rating out of five for, for the book and why, uh, why we give that rating. Corinne, do you want to start? Sure, sure, I'll start. So I, I will give this one a three out of five. So three bookmarks out of five or whatever. Um, I love self-help books I, and I, I'm interested in some philosophy books. My only issue is that I, I, I don't know, information, I like to be highly structured and organized. I do a lot better with the, you know, the tried and true, like, tell me what you're going to tell me, tell me what you're telling me, and then tell me what you told me. Like, I need the, you know, the, the real structure. So I, I struggled a little bit with the, you know, casual conversational kind of like get in and go along for the ride type, um, you know, structure of this one. So, so for me, that's why I kind of rated it a little bit lower as a three was just, uh, yeah, it was a challenge for me to kind of um, find the treasures hidden in the conversations, I guess. Mm. It's well, it's a, it's a two thousand year old style of communication, <laughs> I guess. Right, <laughs> right. Letters. Right. I mean, it's sort of amazing that we get anything out of it, something that old. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, how about you, Donald? I well, this surprise, that's a, a noble surprise, some people. But I'm going to give it f a precisely four and three quarters mm. out of five, and I'm taking off a quarter of a mark because I don't think Seneca is good at formulating a coherent structure of the argument in, his, in most of his essays. And actually in some of his other writings, he's terrible at it and they're all over the place and he's very repetitive, like on benefits is notoriously a, a bit of a chore to get through. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, let us know the silliest are a, little, a bit shorter and they're more engaging. So I'm going to give them four and three quarters. I think there's a lot, a lot of really valuable uh, stuff in there. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Well, you Tom? both make the same point there really about the structure mm -hmm. and yeah, interesting. Um, well, I would I would give it uh, four stars. Um, I mean, I first read Marcus Aurelius' Meditations and loved it. So for me, every page is sort of comparing Seneca's letters to that. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of sort of life nuggets in there. But I was probably more interested in finding out about Seneca's life uh, himself which was fascinating because we've, we've got Marcus Aurelius had got the movie Gladiator. Everyone, mm. everyone's seen sort of knows who he is. So you for say me, John, uh, John Malkovich, John, Val John Malkovich is making a movie about Seneca. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know mm -hmm. that. That's great. It's called On Earthquakes, I think, weirdly, like he, cause he wrote an essay on earthquakes as well. Yeah. Um, so maybe that'll be out in a year or two. Interesting. Uh -huh. yeah. Fantastic. Um, yeah, we'll look forward to that. Um, yeah, so for me, it's a fascinating life as well as, as we've discussed, looking at it alongside the actual work uh, of the man. You know, incredibly event-packed life, lots of ups and downs, exile at the top. Um, so for anyone who's interested, it's definitely worth reading or listening to um, for the actual nuggets of wisdom but just also finding out about Seneca's life itself is fascinating. So, and I'd encourage uh, all, all listeners to actually listen uh, to the book insight on, on Seneca's letters, which Donald actually wrote himself last year. So, and that focuses more on the actual, um, I guess, techniques of Stoicism. Um, like the, the pre-meditatio and the role models um, that we that we sort of touched on. So if you're interested in Seneca at all, make sure you listen to the book insight that we have on, on Seneca's letters. Yeah, yeah. Listening to the book insight is one way of uh, getting more of Donald's work. Donald, do you want to share any other ways if people want to connect with you or your writing, learn more about Stoicism? Mm -hmm. Well, um, my website they can go to, which is just donaldrobertson.name, so it's N-A-M-E instead of dot com. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm one of the founding members of a non-profit organization called Modern Stoicism. It was founded in 2012, and uh, it does a lot of free stuff to teach people about stoicism. And its website is just modern stoicism, all one word, modernstoicism.com. So that's a really good place to get uh, access to articles and free courses and virtual conferences and things like that about stoicism. Mm. Perfect. We'll be sure to include links to those in our show notes for today. Yeah, and um, also that Donald is, uh, well, there's a new edition of Seneca's Letters coming out. I think it's in March or April. 
and Donald has written the introduction to that. So we'll try and include um, some notes on that and a pick. And also um, his fantastic book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor about Marcus Aurelius. It's a great introduction um, to him. So yeah, lots of really good stuff to check out. Uh, so Donald, thank you so much uh, for joining us and explaining Seneca a bit more. Yes, uh, thank you. It was great to have you. Really, really uh, appreciate you sharing your expertise with all of us. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed myself. Thank you for inviting me along. Yes. And if we do anything on Stoicism in the future, we'll definitely have you back. <laughs> cool. That's right. Look forward to it. All right, folks. Well, I thank you for watching on YouTube or listening to our podcast and be sure to tune in next week as we dive into a new nonfiction book, or you can go to memo.com slash insights and check out all of the book insights we have on, on over a hundred titles. All right. Thanks so much and hope you'll tune in again next time. Thank you. Bye.